Welcome everybody and this is going to be the lecture for chapter 19 and this is going to be looking at state building in Africa and this one's going to be a little different it's going to be a little longer but this is going to be the only lecture for the chapter since most of the chapter takes place before the material that's covered by the AP exam I'm going to focus on the information that goes from 1200 to 1450 which is the material that the AP exam is going to cover. So I will touch a little bit on some of the other topics, but a large focus of this is going to be on what was found in Section 1 and a little bit from Section 3. So by the end of this lesson, I want you to be able to explain how and why states in Africa developed and they changed over time. And you're going to create a graphic organizer to keep track of this. And so that's how you're going to follow along the lecture. What I'd like you to do is I'd like you to just uh, pause the slide and or pause the video and think about before you read the section and you completed your notes, what's something that you never knew about this region? And then after reading the section and taking some of the notes, what did you learn? So just kind of pause and reflect on that. You don't have to type the answer in anywhere, um, but I want you to consider that, just those thoughts as we go on to the next slide. So hopefully you did a little bit of pausing and reflecting, and I want to go over a little bit of background. Um, so unlike the other chapters, there's a lot of information that we don't have in this chapter because of the absence of writing. And African societies' cultural developments are largely passed down through the oral tradition of griots, and for the longest time, griots were not considered valid history by many European historians, right? Um, so, and that, that kind of is tied to a little bit of the racist history that takes place during the age of imperialism in the 1800s. So I want to start with a little bit of background to the history of Sub-Saharan Africa, or Africa south of the Sahara. So between 500 BC and about 1500, there was a migration of people known as the Bantu speakers, and the Bantu-speaking people migrated from West Africa down throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, eventually making it out to the East Coast. And as the Bantus migrated, they spread agriculture, and they spread ironwork, and they spread some kind of common culture. So a lot of the, the culture throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, it's very diverse, but there, there are some ties to these Bantu migrations. So out of West Africa came this oral tradition, the oral tradition of a griot, and griots are still used today. And a griot is not just a oral historian, they are also uh, political leaders, they usually travel the region so they know the region very well, they are songwriters, they are poets, they are peacekeepers, they help negotiate treaties because they have this wealth of knowledge. So a griot is someone who has to memorize throughout their life. They are raised to memorize the stories through songs of their region. So modern griots carry with them hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of oral tradition. And that's important in maintaining the culture and of, of telling the stories and developing the, the rich culture of sub-Saharan African cultures. Um, there is... A lot of misconceptions, a lot, and the reason I asked you that question in the previous slide was most people don't know a lot about Africa and they think that sub Saharan Africa is all the same. You know, Africa is the second largest continent, and for the most part, most people in the world, or at least in our part of the world, all they know about Africa is what happened in ancient Egypt and then, you know, jump to the age of imperialism when the Europeans colonized, and, and there's a lot of lack of knowledge of of the richness of African history. And so part of that has to do again with the lack of writing from before um, the introduction of writing by, by Muslim merchants and scholars. But this oral tradition lets us know a lot of what, what uh, well actually not a lot, but it lets us know of some of the developments that were happening. So just understand the importance of the role of griots. And if you want to make some kind of modern connection, you know, a lot of modern hip hop like just hip hop and this idea of storytelling can trace its roots back to these griots in Africa over you know from the western kingdoms like Mali and then a little bit of background of the society 
because it was more isolated than other parts of the world, you know, the Sahara Desert plays this huge geographic barrier. And as a result, sub-Saharan societies were more isolated than the societies of East Asia, South Asia, the Mediterranean, Europe. That doesn't mean there wasn't any connections. There was just not as, um, not as developed. And so as a result of the connections not being as developed, society in Africa was just a little bit slower to grow. The growth was a lot slower than you see in the societies where they're going to war with each other, where they're interacting like between the Abbasids and the Chinese, right, where they're exchanging technology. That diffusion was a little slower in sub-Saharan Africa. And many sub-Saharan African societies are kin-based societies. They're small kinships, chieftains. People live in small groups that are, you know, of people that are related to them, but they do have some political organization. They do have, you know, they did develop military structures. Now, as a result of the Bantu migrations, when the Bantu-speaking people reach the east coast of Africa, they, they also encounter the people that had come from the Pacific Islands, from the South Pacific or from uh, Indonesia, and they had introduced banana cultivation into Madagascar. So then this makes its way, these banana cultivation make its way to the Bantu-speaking people on the coast of the African continent, and pretty soon banana cultivation also spreads. So the Bantu are responsible for spreading agriculture and tools, ironwork, farming. And as a result, between 400 BCE and about 1000, we see this first a slow, you could see from this chart between 400 BCE and 800 CE, which is 1,200 years, you know, it had grown to 11 million people, but between 800 and 1,000, we see that doubling to 22 million. So you're going to see this population growth. Now, what you want to do is you want to pause and you want to create this graphic organizer on, on a piece of notebook paper. And this is where you're going to be taking notes for today. Okay, so you should have paused. I'm going to continue now. And we're going to be looking at, we're going to focus on the kingdoms and we're going to look first at West Africa and Trans-Sahara trade. So like I said earlier, the Sahara Desert is this really, it's, it's an enormous desert. It probably could fit the United States, I believe, inside of the desert. That's how big it is. Um, you know, millions of years ago, it was covered by ocean. And over time, that, you know, that ocean, obviously, as the plates shifted and water evaporated, what we have left is a lot of salt. And so the Sahara Desert was always seen as a place to go and extract salt from. And that's what connected Sub-Saharan Africa with the world in the north of the Mediterranean Sea, like where Egypt is, where Morocco is, where Europe is. Uh, so there had already been roads that had transversed the Sahara. The domestication of the camel, the camel's ability to withstand the, the crazy sandstorms, made it ideal more than a horse for Trans-Sahara travel. But with the rise of Islam and Islamic states in the north, with the rise of the Umayyad and later the Abbasid and then the Caliphate of Cordoba, Muslim merchants gained more interest in wanting to access not just the salt, but also the gold that came from across the Sahara. So we're, we're going to see a much stronger connection now across the Sahara. And this becomes known as the Trans-Sahara trade route. And with this then emerge these strong, powerful kingdoms. And one of those was the kingdom or the empire that you see there of Ghana in the West. And Ghana built its wealth by controlling this trade, by controlling access to the trade that's coming from the south of Ghana and that's going to make its way across the desert. They controlled the towns, towns like Timbuktu, Gao, Jene, right, which later on also become important Mali cities. By controlling these cities, they're able to establish a wealthy kingdom. Although facing raids, they eventually collapse. And we get to a, you know, we fill the void with the later kingdom, the Mali Empire. So the Mali Empire emerges as Ghana declines. And the Mali is going to become one of the more powerful empires of West Africa of this time period that we're going to be looking at. So a ruler by the name of Sundiata, he consolidated power around the Senegal and Niger rivers in West Africa. And he created a centralized power structure, one that will continue after the fall of Mali. It will be um, mimicked later on by the Songhai Empire. So again, like other kingdoms, Mali 
controlled and taxed almost all trade that passed through West Africa. So any merchant who wanted access to goods further south of Mali had to pay taxes to the Mali Empire. And that allowed them to become very rich, very powerful. Now, the kings also converted to Islam and provided lodging and protection for merchants. And that allowed them to, to get some favorable relationship with uh, Muslim traders that were coming across. However, even though they convert, they, they do not follow Islam in a very strict form. They, they are still practicing a lot of their traditional cultural practices. They're dressing the way they traditionally dress. They're not adapting um, the style of dress that you see in North Africa. And they're also not forcing the conversion upon their people. But what this does is it, it establishes trade relations. They're building mosques along important trade cities. And Muslim scholars make their way down there. They serve as judges, as Qadi. And then Mansa Musa, one of the Mali kings, will want to, he converts, he wants to show his devotion to Islam. He makes his pilgrimage to Mecca. And when he returns, he begins to invest a lot more money in um, Islam and in the found funding of schools to teach, centers of learning, some of which still exist today. Um, on a side note, there was a book I was reading a couple years ago called The, the Badass Librarians of Timbuktu. Um, and it talks about the city Timbuktu, which is on the coast of the desert as, as you exit the desert. It was one of the most important trade cities. And during the 13th and 14th century, it became a very important center of Islamic learning that a lot of even Europeans sought knowledge that was coming out of Timbuktu. And at one point, it had one of the largest collection of manuscripts that Muslim scholars had translated from different languages. And the book I was reading, was it's more about what's happening in the modern day, about how because of war and conflict in this part of the region, you have some librarians that are risking their lives to try to pre preserve these antique uh, manuscripts. So, little side note. But you can see from the image here how wealthy uh, and powerful these cities were. These were cities, as you were coming out of the desert, these would be the first cities you would arrive to. And so that wealth, you know, you're going to want to stay somewhere, you're going to want to trade, you're, you're going to want to sleep for a few weeks maybe, you're going to want to eat. And so those became the centers uh, the urban centers. They were not as big as the urban centers in the Islamic world to the north or that we saw in, in South Asia in the last chapter or that we saw in China, but compared to what had existed in Sub-Saharan Africa, these were large large cities, cities like Gao and Timbuktu, uh, the mosque at Jene. So some of these structures still remain and you could see the adaptation. Um, you know, One of the things you may see on an AP exam is you might see a picture like this and It'll tell you that this is a mosque in Timbuktu or, or in Sub-Saharan Africa somewhere. And what you'll want to note is how a religion spreads, but as it spreads, it takes on characteristics of the society that it is spreading to. So this is a mosque, but it is built in the architectural style of the Mali Kingdom. It is not built the way the mosques were being built, for example, um, on, the, on the Arabian Peninsula or in southern Spain, right? It's taken on a very different architecture. And that's an example of how when something, a religion spreads, it isn't going to spread if you force it all the time on people. It's going to spread when you allow the people that are accepting this new religion to maintain some of their cultural elements. And so this mosque is an example of that. And it's still standing today. So, like I mentioned earlier, Mansa Musa was one of the most powerful of the Mali kings, and he is considered by, by many historians to be the richest human ever to live. If you were to calculate his wealth that he controlled, if you were to calculate it into today's dollars, I, I think he would be somewhere like four times richer than Bill Gates. And when he took his pilgrimage to Mecca, when he stopped in Cairo, and he stood there for a few weeks, um, or months actually, he distributed so much gold because part of the pillars of Islam is to give charity. He distributed so much gold that it led to a decline in the price of gold as much as 25% because of all the inflation since a lot of people now had access to gold. So in East Africa, another kingdom that was important is the kingdom of Aksum. 
And this is in East Africa in um, modern-day Ethiopia. And the rulers here observed the Christian faith, and they sought diplomatic with European monarchs. So there is a dynasty that ruled from 1270 all the way to 1974. You have the same family or the same lineage that was a Christian lineage that was ruling Ethiopia. Uh, we'll learn about this later, but in the 1800s, the Italians tried to conquer Ethiopia, and the Ethiopian kings appealed to other Europeans as fellow Christians to come to their aid, and, and they did. So Ethiopia, during the age of imperialism, is one of two African countries to not be conquered um, by Europeans. So you also have Christian kingdoms um, in the north as well. Although Islam was, was starting to become the main tradition for a lot of these uh, North African and West African kingdoms. So we see here churches. You know, uh, these are these are Christian churches in Ethiopia, and this one is carved into the rock in the shape of a cross. So this was all from the kingdom of Axum. And so then there's other kingdoms that were around uh, what is today Nigeria, and they're known as Hausa Kingdom. So you also want to know, um, besides Mali, there were other smaller kingdoms. The origins came from a prince that had come from Baghdad and introduces Islam. So these were Islamic kingdoms as well. And like Mali and like Ghana, cities that became markets for Trans-Sahara trade and for local trade served as these trans-regional hubs. Rulers here adopted Muslim script and Muslim ruling style, and they converted the region to Islam. So there were some kingdoms that actually were a lot more hardcore in their conversion to Islam than Mali, although they were not as powerful. And then down in the southeast is the Great Zimbabwe, which served as a city center that connected East Africa, the coast, with the interior. So a lot of the goods that are transferring uh, in the in, transporting in the interior of Africa coming from Mali down. So that means goods that make their way from Europe, from North Africa, making their way down into Mali, and then further south will eventually get to the Great Zimbabwe, which was in Central Africa. And then from here, merchants would take those goods to East Africa and connect it with the East Coast that we'll talk about in a little bit. So at its peak, the Great Zimbabwe had about 18,000 people. And again, kings control and tax trade. So if you don't know what that means, it means that in order for you to safely get from one place to another within their kingdom, and, you want, and you're transporting goods, you have to pay a tax. If you don't pay the tax, you can be arrested, you can have your goods confiscated. So for a merchant, you're going to want to pay your tax because the taxes are usually not very high. So they may be a little uncomfortable, but you're going to make a lot more money once you reach your destination. And so that taxing of trade and, and, and controlling it is what allowed, what allowed a lot of these African kingdoms to thrive. So the Great Zimbabwe organizes the flow of gold that comes from the interior of Africa. Ivory, as you know, comes from elephant um, and rhinoceros tusks. And then also slaves and other local products that were being transported. So slavery is already happening, um, but it's not happening at the level it will reach later on when we get to the transatlantic slave trade. But you have um, slaves already being traded to the islands in the Mediterranean and to the Arab world, as well as within Africa. And on the east coast of Africa, we see a different development, and that's the development of the Swahili city-states. And you might have remembered me talking about this before in the previous chapter, or when we talked about the spread of Islam. Swahili is a language that develops on the east coast of Africa as Arab-speaking merchants are trading with the Bantu-speaking merchants that speak the different Bantu languages of East Africa, and they, they end up developing a language that blends elements of both languages so that for the purpose of trade. And so that becomes known as the Swahili language and the Swahili culture. And so Swahili is going to dominate the coast of East Africa. And geographic barriers make it hard for East, you know, for you to go from East Africa to West Africa. It's very difficult because of the geography of Africa. 
It is mostly flat all around the coastline, but then within a few hundred miles of the coast, it all of a sudden rises with these giant escarpments, these cliffs, and then most of Africa is located about 2,000 feet above sea level on plateaus. So the geography is not very easy to navigate, especially if you don't have you know modern roads, modern automobiles. And so you're going to have a very different culture emerging in East Africa. And by the 10th century, more Islamic merchants are going to spread. They're going to uh, spread Islam. And you're going to see the emergence of powerful trade cities. And these cities are going to supervise the trade that takes place in the Indian Ocean. That was the trade that we talked about in the last chapter. So the same monsoon pattern that made merchants stay in India for months until they waited the winds, the same pattern is happening in East Africa. So in city-states like Mogadishu or Mombasa, Sofala, Kilwa, you have merchants who have to live there for a few months until the winds pick up. So you're going to see the same pattern, the pattern that, that took place in India, right? The creation of these warehousing places called Emporia are going to take place. And so East Africa is going to be much more connected with Afro-Eurasian trade. They're going to be trading with people as far as China, and you're going to have Chinese merchants, and there have been Chinese products found on the east coast of Africa, as well as African products found in cities in China. So, the, so East Africa is a lot more connected. And again, just also be able to know and identify by name, just names of important um, city-states. So Mogadishu, which is now in Somalia, modern-day Somalia, was one of those. You can see the remnants of these old trading posts. Lamu in Kenya is another East African city-state. You can see the old quarters, very antique city. And in one of those pictures, you could see one of the um, Dow ships that we talked about in the last chapter. Malindi in Kenya is another one. And today Malindi is known more for its uh, beautiful beaches and resorts. But people who go visit there go look for the ruins as well. Uh, Mombasa, Kenya, which is still a very important trading city today. Um, and then Kilwa, this is this was in Kilwa. Actually, no, I think it's also near Mombasa. Uh, Zanzibar in Tanzania, which is another place that today is known for more for its resort living than it is for trade. But again, you still see the remnants of these were imported. These were warehouses that were built. And Kilwa is in Tanzania. And so uh, Sofala and Mozambique. Right. So when you see these, you know, these are, you should know the nature of city states. And when we talk about writing assignments, uh, the short answer questions that we're going to look at Wednesday, we're going to be looking at some of these city states with some of the writing that we're going to be doing. Okay. So that is it for this chapter. So this is going to be the only lecture on the chapter because, like I said, I'm focusing on the material that's going to be covered on the AP exam. Um, but if you have any questions about the chapter, we'll talk about that. Uh, in class. If you have any questions, bring them to class with you. Okay, that's it for today, and I'll see you on Wednesday.